Well, I get to welcome up my beautiful bride, Joanna, today as she closes out our joyful series. All right. Well, who is glad that we have holidays here? Oh, my goodness. Who had fun on Thanksgiving? Good. I, some of you didn't have fun. I don't know why. Um, I hope you got to celebrate at least a little. Um, who ate too much? All of us, yeah. Um, who's already had enough leftovers? Who's sick of leftovers already? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, let's see. Uh, who had, I, I want to pronounce this correctly, who, who had a, a trip, tryptophan, tryptophan nap on, on uh, Thanksgiving? Anybody? You eat the turkey and then you take a nap? Okay, that, not everybody. I'm surprised. Okay, so the rest of you were watching the Cowboys? Yeah, there we go. I knew we had some Cowboys fans. Come on, they, they, are, they are actually doing good this year. John's like, don't talk about the Cowboys. Come on. Um, anyway, hey, I mean, we watch them every year, and it's kind of sad that this year they actually won. So, sorry, no offense, but yeah, that, that was fun. Um, hey, we are in a series called Joyful, and part of the, the heart in this series is because we recognize that I think there was kind of a lot of heaviness over the last several weeks, over the last month, really over the last several years. And I think it's funny because we had two friends who pastor here in Colorado, and both of them, uh, at the same week that we started our series, they started a series on mental health and depression. And it was crazy because we all really can sense it, right? Everybody, can we sense it? It's happening. Even the holidays can be some of the dep- most depressing times for people, partially because we're stressed out of our minds, and partially because for some people, the holidays just reminds them of loved ones that aren't with them, and, and it could be a harder time. Um, so it's, it's crazy, because we were, we were discussing and trying to pick the, the series and the name for it, and I'm all like, I'm the pessimist in the group, so I'm like... No, this is just going to be on, like, depression, and we're going to... And John's like, I think it just needs to be... His original title was going to be Make It Fun. He's like, we just need to make church fun. Like, people need to know about joy. And so we ended up, after much prayer and deliberation, um, we called it Joyful, um, with the idea that we want to be a church that is full of joy. Because the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we would rather preach about what we... Need We would rather preach about the truth than preach about the darkness that's happening. We want to claim the truth over our culture and over our world. And so with that, we were like, okay, this is the series. And then I don't even know who came up with this idea. But somehow, I think it was John, he was like, we need to talk about some of the festivals, some of the parties that the Jewish people have. And I'm like, cool, that stresses me out because I know nothing about Jewish culture and I don't want to have to preach about something I don't know about. Um, But it was awesome because I got to really research. So we've been talking about, we've done two so far, but we are talking about the three festivals that the Jewish people celebrate that are called pilgrimage. Thank you. I'm like, what is the word? Which means that all the men would take a pilgrimage, would journey to Jerusalem to celebrate these festivals. So that's kind of what we've been weaving in is, hey, we all read our Bible, I hope. I hope. Okay. Um, and we read over and that the festival of this and the festival and the feast of this. And we're all, I don't, I don't know what these things are, right? So I just kind of like skip past it. I'm like, I don't know. So hopefully this series has given you guys at least a little bit of um, knowledge about some of the festivals. Because I believe the reason God had his people celebrate and do festivals is because he's a fun God. Yes, and because he knew that we would need to celebrate, that we would need to pause and to have fun. So I get the privilege of welcoming up two of my best friends in the entire world. I love them more than anything, and they are actually going to help us today. If you guys didn't know, our kids actually memorize our theme verse for the series. So we always have a series verse, and we, our elementary kids, K through three, they learn the same message every week. If you didn't know, they learn the same message, the same story, the same scriptures, so you can go home and talk about it with your kids. 
But with that, they learn a verse every series. And since today is the last week of our series, today they are reciting their verse and they're getting a prize. And if it's your first week and you're like, oh, no, my kid, don't worry. We, like, help them and they get a prize too. So it's all good. Everybody, really everybody gets a prize. But we're, we're bribing them to memorize the word of God. So let's welcome up my two best friends, Joy and Josie. These are my girls. John, can you hand me the handheld mic? These are my girls. Joy is in second grade and Josie is in kindergarten. And they are going to teach you guys our theme of verse from Ecclesiastes. All right, you ready? You going to do the, ver- the motions? All right, how about this? Oh, oh, so... along with the hard work they do under the sun. Ecclesiastics 8.15. Good job, girls. All right, they're going to head back to Kids Church. All right, when your children come back, you got to make sure that they know the verse. Be like, what's the theme verse, okay? So if you notice in that verse, it said, so I recommend having fun, basically. So I recommend that we enjoy life. So I recommend that we have happiness along with, did you catch that with the shovel? Along with all the hard work. Why? Because life is hard. I'm just going to tell you, if, if it's not yet, you're probably a teenager or younger. <laughs> actually, teenagers, it's actually really hard. It's probably a lot harder than the adults. So if you don't know that yet, adults, you think, oh, your life is so easy. It's actually 10 times harder than when we were teenagers. And I'm pretty young. So if you're older than me, it's like 20 times harder than when you were a teenager. I'm just saying. But anyway, um, but if you don't realize that life is hard yet, you're probably a child. Um, but life is hard. And so God is giving us a strategy. Hey, I recommend having fun, enjoying life, eat, drink, have some happiness along with the hard work. So John shared um, these pictures last week, which are the summary of all three of the festivals. So the first week he talked about Pentecost, uh, sorry, Passover. Last week he talked about Pentecost, which is a festival in May or June for the wheat harvest. Today I'm going to be talking about our third festival or feast that they would call it the Feast of of tabernacles. It usually happens right about now, September, October, and um, it's usually after the fruit harvest or after they get all the, they would do it after harvest because then they could, you know, like they're done working and they get to actually, um, I don't know why it doesn't move. Can I move it? Is that better? My heel just, there's like a hole. I just like lost my, I'm like, oh, I'm going to move it forward. Um, So the three things um, this next slide shows you guys is what these all meant. So if you missed the past couple weeks, you guys can go ahead and go back and look at them. The first one, the, um, the feast of Passover, right? In the Old Testament, they were celebrating it because the the angel of death passed over the people, right? And they were able to not die, even though all the Egyptians died. Um, But in the New Testament, we recognize that Jesus is the lamb that was slain. It's his blood that was over the doorpost. His blood is over our hearts, right? Um, The next one last week, the Pentecost, that God gave his law to the people in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we recognize that the Holy Spirit writes the law of God on our hearts. It's not just in a book, but the Holy Spirit writes his law on our hearts. And this week for the Feast of Tabernacles, we are going to talk about how we are to host the presence of God, that we are the temple or the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, and he wants to dwell inside of us. So let's pray. God, I am just so grateful that your presence is here in this house, but also, God, that your presence can dwell inside of me. God, I'm so grateful that you sent the Holy Spirit 
to be in us, to dwell with us. God, we need you more than ever. And I pray that after today, God, that everyone who leaves would be full of joy. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you guys have heard us talk about the chosen. Um, I will say, for those of you that are like, I don't like it. Uh, it takes a while to get into. It is a TV show that is definitely, they take a lot of liberties. So my hope would be that you would watch it and then recognize what things are not in the Bible. Okay? That you're not like, oh, this lady, Rama, sure, she must be a Bible character. Okay? Read your Bible. All right? So I'm not saying... The Chosen is like completely scriptural. They obviously had to take some liberties. But I wanted to show you a clip because I thought what better way for you guys to learn about the Feast of Tabernacles than to actually watch a video of Jesus and the disciples getting ready for it. They also would call it the Festival of Booths, which is basically another way of saying tents, okay, or the Feast of Shelters. All of this because when God set up this feast, he said, all right, Every time you celebrate this, I want you to take seven days and I want you to make a temporary shelter and I want you to stay, live outside for seven days in this temporary shelter to remember that our ancestors, their ancestors, not us, but that the Israelites had to travel around for 40 years. And because they basically were just making circles in the wilderness, um, they could never build a permanent home. They had to just have a tent. And then when the presence of God moved, they were like, all right, we got to follow the cloud today. We got to pick up and move. And so they lived in temporary shelters for 40 years. So the object of this um, festival was for them to remember. The object of every holiday is for us to pause and just remember the good things God has done. So you guys are going to watch this. They're going to be setting up their little booth, their little... Um, tent and then um, you'll hear kind of a little bit of the backstory of why they celebrate this. Should I move it? First? Yeah, I've never been to Jerusalem. Really? How is that possible? My father never took me and my mother to the feasts. This is your first feast of the tabernacles? Uh, no, this is just my first time in Jerusalem. Tabernacle is a temporary dwelling. It's a tent. I know what the tabernacle is. So what? Do we have to build one to eat? Mm-hmm. I was being facetious. God said to live in a booth for seven days during this feast to commemorate how the children of Israel lived in temporary shelters for 40 years in the desert. Still out. One of three pilgrimage holidays where every able-bodied Israelite male who traveled to Jerusalem can present himself before Adonai. You really don't know about any of this stuff. I've already admitted that I don't know all of it. I didn't pay much attention. I do recall my father used to leave three times a year. Why is it only the men are required to go? It can be a perilous journey. Difficult for children and the sick, people who need caretakers, but it doesn't prohibit anyone. I've taken Eden many times. Ah! Sharp. All right, I need some bodies to go into town with me. Nathaniel gave me a list of supplies for this masterpiece of his. Mm, pick me. Pick me, Simon. As long as you stop doing that. Done? Who With all due respect, Nathaniel, I know you're a skilled architect, but this thatch root won't keep the rain out. That's the point. The vegetation provides shade from the sun during the day. And if a few raindrops get through, it is a reminder of our dependence on God, of his provision and of how our people were so vulnerable in the wilderness. And he brought us through. There was a time in my life, in my old life, where I had to sleep outside. It is a good reminder of how I was delivered from that. This time of dwelling in booths is also a leveler of people. Wealthy, poor, everyone sleeps outside as equals. Well, let's be honest. 
Not all booths are created equal. Yes, Nathaniel. The beauty of this booth is itself an act of worship. Rabbi, I have a question. Yes. In the prophet Zechariah, it is written, and everyone who has survived of all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Wait, what? Zechariah says that? They read that passage of the feast every year? You just don't pay attention. Now, there's a lot of readings. They sort of run together. What exactly is your question, Big James? One day, our enemies will celebrate this feast with us? Babylonians, Assyrians, Romans. the Romans, Jews and Gentile at this table? What would have to happen for that to be possible? Something will have to change. But the boots won't mean anything to them. We're the ones who dwelt in temporary shelters while we wandered the wilderness, not them. Everyone has wandered through the wilderness at some point. If all the nations came to celebrate in Jerusalem, there will not be enough room, not by... I will not bore you with the calculations. I think it will not be Jerusalem as we know it now. Certainly not. But if Zachariah prophesied it, it will be fulfilled, right? It just sounds impossible. I know a thing or two about prophecies that sound impossible. Anyone have other questions? <laughs> All right. Did you guys enjoy that? Maybe it gave you a little taste. Um, if, if, if you watch it, you'll know all the characters and, and there's backstory and all that. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to jump in. I'm going to read as much scripture as I possibly can because if you don't know this about me, I love the Bible. I love the Old Testament. I love digging in. And I want to teach you guys as much as I possibly can in the next well, not very much time. So, <laughs> um, so here's what, I, I'll start with this. I think I put it on um, your notes. The purpose of feast and holidays. And we're going to talk about what the purpose of those was. When the, one of the first times that they really celebrated this feast is because God gave a command to Moses in Leviticus chapter 23. If you want, you can turn there. It's page 105. But in Leviticus chapter 23, that's where he said, hey, for seven days you're going to live outside um, I think it's like a command that we're all supposed to go camping at least once a year. I think, I think, I think that's what it's saying. So shameless plug, we do a church camping trip every year. I guess now all of you have to do it with us. There we go. Yeah, we're no campers. We're just going to sleep outside. Um, but anyway, God had set up all these festivals for Moses, and I truly believe it was because he wanted to teach us how to pause, how to celebrate, how to have fun. In Moses' day, when he dedicated the temple, when he dedicated, not the temple, but the tabernacle, right? He called everybody together, and they actually celebrated this. It says in, let's actually go there. Um, uh, well, well, we'll talk about that. Moses did it, but also King Solomon. Both times that they were dedicating first the tabernacle and then with King Solomon, the temple. When they were dedicating this, it was actually at the festival of tabernacles is what it said. Or the annual festival of shelters is what first King said. And it says that they dedicated the tabernacle, they dedicated the temple, and then the presence of God fell so thick. And so heavy, it was like a cloud. That's what this series is about. It's about having the presence of God so full inside of us. People can tell. That we can tell. That we're full of the presence of God. So, let's start with number one. The purpose of feasts and holidays is, number one, to thank God. Because... We would not, I, I, maybe you would, but I think if we didn't have holidays 
and, and even Sabbath, which is what we're supposed to do once a week, we would just keep going. Like all of us, we're, it's like we're the Energizer Bunny. We're just like go, go, go from day to day to day and we never pause. But the purpose of these festivals and these celebrations and the purpose of holidays even, and we're about to get into the holiday season, is for us to actually take some time off and to actually pause and to actually say, wow, God has been good. I can thank him, right? That's what the Israelites were doing. They were thanking God that he brought them through the wilderness. And you heard Jesus at the end. James was like, I don't understand. How is everybody going to celebrate this? Why would they celebrate it if their ancestors didn't wander the wilderness, right? My ancestors, I'm not Jewish, so my ancestors didn't wander the wilderness. But Jesus said, well, I think that all of us have had a wilderness time. Would you agree with that? So we all have a reason to thank God. Maybe you're still in a wilderness, but I would venture to say that you've probably had a wilderness in the past that God brought you out of. So the first thing is to thank him, to pause, to celebrate. I wrote um, this verse down, Deuteronomy chapter 16. This is page 163. If you didn't know, we always have Bibles for you under your seats or in the seat in front of you because we want to open up the Bible. So if you see the Bibles in front of you, it's page 163. Otherwise, it's Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. And this is where it talks about all three of the festivals. So at the beginning of the chapter, it talks about Passover. And then halfway through, it talks about the festival of harvest. Um, which is Pentecost, and then at verse 13, the festival of shelters. You must observe the festival of shelters for seven days. And at the end, after everything, right, after the grain has been threshed and the grapes have been pressed, the festival will be a what? A happy time of celebrating with your sons and daughters and male and female servants and basically everybody, the Levites, but also the foreigners and the orphans and the widows from your town. For seven days you must celebrate this festival to honor the Lord your God at the place he chooses. For it is him, it is God, it is he who blesses us with bountiful harvest and gives you success in all your work. So when we thank God, it's pausing to remember, wait a second, the success I have in life is not because of me. It's him. It's pausing to remember, okay, I've been working hard, but wait a second. I have been working hard, but it is God who gives me the ability to work hard. It's God who even gave me my job. And so thanking God, pausing to celebrate. Um, I, I shared this with the women last month. We In Women's Life, I kind of talked a little bit about gratitude. And they actually have studies that show that people are actually healthier who practice gratitude, who pause to look at what's good in their life. Now, we all could look at all the things that are going wrong, but when we pause to look at what's good, it actually helps us. Point number two, the purpose of feasts and holidays is to worship him. So in the same chapter, we were in Deuteronomy chapter 16, so just go down to the next verse. Verse 16 says, every year... Every man in Israel must celebrate these three festivals, right? So Passover, Pentecost, and Festival of Shelters. On each of these occasions, all men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he chooses, but they must appear, they must not appear before the Lord without a gift for him. All must give as they are able, according to the blessings given to them by the Lord your God. In ancient times, worship was sacrifice. Sacrifice, bringing a gift to God, that is our reasonable act of worship. The Bible calls it that we are to be a living sacrifice, bringing ourselves as the gift to him, saying, okay, this isn't about singing songs. This is actually about worshiping you. And so I hope that in Christmas, when you guys get together with your family, because Thanksgiving's already gone, that you take some time to do that. Take some time to worship as a family. That's what holidays, celebration should be about. And the last thing is to obey him, to remember his instructions. It's still in Deuteronomy, but you're going to have to turn a few more pages to page 174. Deuteronomy chapter 31 tells what they would do when they celebrated these feasts. 
verse 9, Deuteronomy 31, verse 9. So Moses wrote this entire book of instruction in a book, and he gave it to the priest who carried the ark of the Lord's covenant and to the elders of Israel. And Moses gave them this command. At the end of every seventh year, the year of release, during the what? Festival of shelters, feast of tabernacles, feast of booths. All of those mean the same thing. So when you read them in the Bible, they all mean the same thing. You must read this book of instruction to all the people of Israel when they assemble before the Lord your God at the place he chooses. Call them all together, men, women, children. Right there. We're not just supposed to read the Bible ourselves. We're supposed to get our children together. We're not just supposed to, like, open presents on Christmas. Pull out Luke chapter 2 and be like, we're not opening presents until we've read the Christmas story. We're going to read the instructions of God. We're going to read the Bible together as a family. That's going to be a part of our festivals, our parties, our holidays from here on out, right? Got lost. All of them, men, women, children, and the foreigners living in your town so that they may hear this book of instruction and learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully obey all the terms of these instructions. Obey. So, you guys getting a little bit, you kind of understanding the Festival of Tabernacles. I think that it can remind us of two different things. I put here two different clouds because if you read in Scripture over and over, there were two clouds that would happen. Exodus chapter 40, page 83. Exodus Genesis, Exodus, right at the beginning. Exodus chapter 40. This is exactly the story I was talking about. That when Moses dedicated the tabernacle, okay, they got all the things together. They've got the outer courts. They've got the inner courts. They've got the Holy of Holies. Anyone know what's in the Holy of Holies? The The Ark of the Covenant, which was considered the presence of God, was housed in this ark. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So basically, they get everything together, and Moses dedicates it, and he's like, okay, here we go. And Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, here's what happened. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Listen to this. This cloud was so thick that Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. But whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would do what? They'd pack up their shelters, pack up their shelter, their, their booths, their tents, their whatever. They'd pack it all up. They'd set out on their journey and they would follow it. But if the cloud didn't rise, they would remain where they were until it had lifted. So number one is the cloud of direction. That this reminds us, the festival of tabernacles is to remind us that we are to give our directions from God. That instead of every morning waking up and looking at my iCal and saying, all right, what do I have going on today? That the first question should not be, what do I have on my calendar, but where is the cloud? Where is the presence of God today? Where is God leading me to today? Who does he want me to talk to? What does he have for me to do? What does he want on my schedule today? Not do I, what I want, but what does he want? That's what the Israelites did every single day. The Festival of Tabernacles is to remind us to keep that awareness of where is the cloud? Is it still resting on the tabernacle or has it gotten up and has it moved? And is God asking me to do something different today? Because I don't want to be a people that's just Plowing away. What did John say? You said powering through. I don't want to be like that. And I am. I'm totally a power through person. I just want to be like, we're just going to go and do. I want to be like, God, first, where are you? I want to follow your direction. Because Jeremiah 29 11 says, for I know the plans that he, that he has for us. Not my plans. His plans are for good and not for evil. His plans are to give us a future and a hope. So I want to first seek the cloud to say, God, where do you want me to go? Point number two is this. The cloud of his presence. You caught it a little bit in there. It said that the cloud was so thick that what, Moses? He couldn't even get in. Man, I would love it if the presence of God was here so thick we couldn't even leave. 
but like I don't even know where the door is. I'm just going to stay here. I'm just going to be here in the presence of God. I, um, I thought that it would be really cool for us to read this in Exodus 33 because we're going to sing a song about this in a little bit. Exodus chapter 33, this is page 75. Exodus chapter 33, verse 7 through 11, talks about how this cloud was the presence of God. And it was Moses' practice, verse 7, to take the tent of meeting, to set it up some distance from the camp. And everyone who wanted to make a request would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would get up. They'd stand at the entrances of their tents, and they would all watch Moses until he disappeared and inside As he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. And when the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and they would bow down in front of their own tents. But inside the tent of meeting, inside that cloud, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one who speaks to a friend. The Feast of Tabernacles is to remind us more than anything else, we need the presence of God in our lives. We have a God who wants to speak to us face to face as one speaks to a friend. We have a God who is not just up in heaven making rules. What's the difference between Christianity and all the other religions? Is that we have a personal God who says it doesn't matter that you have sin. I already paid for that. I already made a way. I want to speak to you face to face. There's actually a chapter in here where God wanted the people. Moses is like, all right, let's all go meet. And the people were like, nope, we're not doing it. You do it, Moses. Like God wanted to speak to all the people. And they all chickened out and were like, nope, you can do it for us, Moses. But God wants to not just speak to the pastors. He wants to speak to each one of you face to face. That cloud of his presence, it wasn't just an Old Testament thing. It's a New Testament thing. It's a today thing. It's a he wants to meet with us. I talked about the, the, the temple, the tabernacle, right? There's, there's all these instructions on how to build it. And, you know, you kind of like would go from one place to the other. And you've got like the holy place. But then where the ark was, the holy of holies, only one person could go in there and meet with God. And only once a year. One person, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, which I think is five days after, no, five days before the Festival of Tabernacles. It was five days something. I'll have to look at my notes. But either way, one time a year, one person could go into the Holy of Holies. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty depressing. Only one person But here's the amazing thing, that Jesus came down to earth basically to be our high priest so that we all can now have access to the presence of God, so that every one of us can enter into his presence, can have a conversation face to face with God, and that is because of this. What does it mean to us today, number one, that we are the new tabernacle of the Holy Spirit? That we now, because of what Jesus did on the cross, praise the Lord, we don't have to fly to Israel to go talk to God and go to the tabernacle, which the temple's not even there. If you guys don't know, that's the, you need to go to Israel. Shameless plug, we're going to go in a couple years. Um, so... Get, get ready. We're going to go. But praise God, we don't have to go there because why? We are now the new temple, the new tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. John read this verse a couple weeks ago. 1 Corinthians, page 952. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, page 952 says, Don't you realize that your body is what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. This festival of tabernacles is to remind us that, wait a second, it's not just back in Israel. 
It's not something that is just for back then. It's to remind us that right now, today, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the same way that the Holy Spirit would rest on the temple, would rest on the tabernacle, the same way that that cloud would fall so thick and heavy on that temple and on that tabernacle is what God wants to do in our hearts. The Bible says that in his presence, Psalm 1611, in his presence is fullness of joy. This, this, this whole thing has been about being joy filled, joyful. How do we get joy? How do we break out of the heaviness of our culture? How do we break out of the, just the yuck that we feel? How do we break out of the hardness of our life, the things that aren't that easy? How do we break out of it? It's in his presence. His fullness of joy. Guys, we've got to learn to get in his presence. we got to learn to get in his presence. John talked about it. Man, I was super heavy. The fr- was it the first week of this series? I-, I was not in a good place. And I called my mentor and-, and she said, she prayed over me. And then she said, Joanna, you know what to do. I'm the worship leader. Yes, I know. She's like, you got to worship, Joanna. She's like, you got to worship. You got to praise God. You got to ask the presence of God to fill you full. Because if the presence of God is full inside of our temple, inside of our tabernacle, if the presence of God has filled us full, then there's no room for anxiety. There's no room for depression. There's no room for hard hearts. There's no room for sickness. There's no room for bondage because the presence of God frees us. The Bible says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So if the spirit of the Lord is dwelling inside of our temple, is dwelling inside of our tabernacle, he's come to bring freedom. There is nothing that our culture needs more than the presence of God. We got to learn how to get into the presence of God. When I was pregnant with Joy, the older one that was up here, God gave us the name Joy. And, and then we were getting ready to write her dedication. Baby dedications are next week, and they've got to write, all of you, if you didn't know, you have to write a blessing for your children. And God gave us that scripture, in your presence is fullness of joy. And I felt like God said the fullness of who she will be will be recognized when she learns how to be in my presence. And I was like, oh, that's good, God. And then he reminded me, Joanna, your middle name is Joy. The fullness of who you are to be is going to be recognized when you're in my presence. And I believe that's for every one of us. The fullness of who God has called us to be. The temple of the Holy Spirit. Full of the presence of God. We may be the only church someone ever attends. I may be the only temple, the only tabernacle that someone ever attends, when they attend my temple, when they meet with me, when they're with me, do they experience the cloud, the presence of the Holy Spirit? Or am I just like anybody else? Is there something different about me? Am I so full of the Holy Spirit that it oozes out to everyone else? atmosphere that I carry. Think about a house. Anybody gone into a home that it just feels different? You're like, is it the feng shui? Is it the Joanna Gaines like vibe I'm getting? I don't know. I believe even more than pretty looking homes. Is your home full of the presence of God? Are we worshiping in our homes so that there's the spirit of God so Jesus said, hey guys, it's better that I leave so that I can send the Holy Spirit. Why would that be better? Because now the Holy Spirit can be everywhere because he's inside of us. That's what God's ultimate plan was. was not that the tabernacle, that the temple would be in one spot. But that the tabernacle, the temple, the presence of the Holy Spirit would be in us. So here's the best news. We have access to the presence of God. And maybe we don't realize it. I think we take it for granted. 
honestly, we do, because we live in a free country and we can go worship whenever we want and we're not persecuted, but we also don't even recognize what the Jewish people went through, that they had to travel three times a year just to get to the temple. But even then they couldn't even go in. They just had to like give their lamb to the, to the high priest and he got to go into the presence of God. But here's the best news. I don't know if you guys have caught this before, but when I read this for the first time, I think I was in high school, something clicked in my heart and I finally realized what an honor it is that I get to worship God. And it's this, it's in Mark, it's in a couple of the gospels. It's when Jesus was hanging on the cross right about to give his last breath. You ready for this? It's right after Passover, which means they just sacrificed the sacrificial lamb, right? Jesus is on the cross. Mark chapter 15, verse 37 and 38. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry and he breathed his last. He died. And here's what it says. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What does that mean? Remember when I said you got the holy place and then only the high priest could go in the holy of holies. The holy of holies was separated by this super thick curtain that was just like, like fabric after fabric after fabric. After fabric. It was at least four inches thick, right? And there was no doors. The only way the high priest got in there is like God like transported him to the holy of holies. All of a sudden, the access that only one person could get through that curtain. Only one person could go to the Holy of Holies. In one moment when Jesus died, he said, uh-uh, that's not what I want. I'm going to tear the curtain. I'm going to tear the separation. I'm going to tear the void. Veil in Hebrew actually means separation. I'm going to take away what has separated you from my presence. I'm going to rip that apart because I'm not satisfied with only meeting with the high priest. I want to meet with everyone one of you face to face as I would meet with a friend. What Jesus did on the cross is what gives us access to the presence of God. And Hebrews chapter 4 says it best. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. He says, so because we have a high priest, the verse right before it says we have a high priest who understands our weakness, right? So because of the high priest, because of Jesus, because of what he did on the cross, because he tore the curtain, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. And there we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Exodus chapter 33, I read it a little bit ago, but here's what happens with Moses. It says that he would meet with God face to face. Exodus chapter 33, this is page 75, 33, verses 12 through 18. One day Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, I should read this in my Bible, I love reading it out of the Bible. Exodus chapter 33, verse 12. One day Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You've told me I know you by name and I look favorably upon you. And it's true that you look favorably on me. Then let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. So the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses. I will give you rest and everything will be fine for you. And then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. What if that was our prayer every morning? If you don't go with me, I'm not leaving my prayer closet. I'm not leaving my prayer chair. I'm not leaving my bedroom. I'm not leaving until your presence goes with me. I don't want to go anywhere without the presence of God. Moses says, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. For how will anyone know that you look favorably on me and on your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart. What is going to make us look different 
than our neighbors, than our friends, than everyone else around us. It's the presence of God. Your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. And the Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I will look favorably upon you, and I know you by name. And Moses responded, then show me your glory. So here's what we're going to do. We need the presence of God. That's it. So as a church, we're going to seek God right now. And I want to invite you to do something you've never done. If you want to see something you've never seen before, you got to do something you've never done before. So maybe for some of you, you're actually going to sing for the first time. Maybe you're going to close your eyes, picture yourself in front of Jesus. Maybe you've never raised your hands and you're going to raise your hands. You never knelt, you're going to kneel. Maybe you want to come to the front. You've never come to the front. You've always wanted to. If you want more of the presence of God, we got to be like Moses. we got to put a demand on God to say, God, I'm not leaving my house until I have the presence of God inside of me. Lord, if I am your temple, I don't want to be an empty temple. I want to be a temple that houses the presence of God. I want to be set apart from everyone else on earth because your presence Maybe you're in this room and you're like, I, I don't know how I would have the presence of God inside me. I don't even have a relationship with God. And there's a phrase that we always would say as a kid, have you asked Jesus into your heart? No, that's how my kids word it. I asked Jesus in my heart, but that's essentially what you're doing is inviting the Holy Spirit inside of you. That's what it means to have a relationship with God is to say, God, I'm tired of doing it my own way. I don't want to do it my own way. You are my Lord and my Savior. So let's close our eyes. Let's have a moment with Jesus. If you're in this room and you're like, I know I don't have the presence of God inside of me because I don't have a relationship with him, and you are ready to give your life to Jesus, you're ready to make him Lord and Savior, why don't you just slip your hand up just to him? You're raising your hand to him to say, God, I want your presence inside of me. God, I want a relationship with you. God, I say you are my Lord and Savior. room and you're saying, I want to be full of the presence of God. In his presence is fullness of joy. I want to be filled with the presence of God. If that's you and you're ready, why don't you stand up in this place? If you're ready for more of the Holy Spirit, if you're ready for God, stand up. We're going to worship. Worship team, come on up. You guys can stand. God, we are ready to be filled with your presence. God, we don't want to do anything on our own. Lord, we don't want to take another step without you. So let's do this. Let's just say this prayer. Let's say, Jesus, we invite you. Holy Spirit, fill us.